welcome back. This is week eight, and that's the last example uh, for this week. So the example, I'm calling it high school and beyond. Um, and this is referring to data uh, where 200 observations were randomly sampled from the high school and beyond survey. The same students took a reading test and a writing test. At first glance, how are the distributions of reading and writing scores similar? How are they different? So let's look at uh, box plots here. And we can see that the median at least score of writing is a bit higher than the median score of reading. And then the question we can ask is whether um, there is a difference between these two. A reliable difference. I mean, there is a difference in, me, in median. Is this difference large enough for us to say that it's more than just sampling error, that there is a reliable um, a considerable difference that would be unlikely to be observed if reading and writing performance is just the same, right, in the population. One thing I want you to notice is that different from what we've seen with the study on distraction, we have the same students taking the reading and writing test. So the average reading came from what was given by the same group of people uh, as the average of writing, the observed average of writing tests. This is different from before because before we had one group that was distracted that was formed for, you know, by 22 people. And the group that did not get distracted was not the same people on a different day. It was other people, completely independent groups. So we couldn't pair the scores in any, um, in any um, reasonable, rational way. Here it's different. We have one student that takes the writing and takes the reading test. So we can see the difference for each student in the performance of these two types of tests. So when we have that situation, we have dependent means, not independent means, and we run, instead of independent t-tests, we run dependent t-tests. And you see how that plays out and how you explore the data and check assumptions when we get to the lab. But for now, I want you to remember that whenever you have paired sample or dependent population means, then we want to run a paired t-test. Can the reading and writing scores for a given student be assumed to be independent from each other? The question is, mm -mm -mm, right? For each student, they take the two tests and the probability that the performance in one is related to the performance in the other within the students is kind of high, right? So if you're already a good reader, the, the probability of you also being sort of a good writer um, is kind of correlated. So you can't assume that independence between groups of means. So to analyze paired data, when two sets of observations have this special correspondent, they are not independent, they are said to be paired. And to analyze, to analyze paired data, it is often useful to look at the difference in outcomes of each pair of observations. So I compute a difference variable, not by getting the average of one group and the average of the other group and comparing the average difference, but I do it pair by pair. So it is important, however, that we always subtract using a consistent order. I cannot for one participant do read minus write and for the other participant do write minus read, right? Because then my difference variable will be kind of funky if I do that. Anyway, so you can compute actually a difference variable um, by subtracting for each one What's the difference between read minus write? That's five. What's the difference between read minus write here? So if writing is better than reading, then the difference is expected to be less than zero, right? If reading is better than writing, the difference would be expected to be more than zero, okay? All right, so this is the that if I take the average of all of these differences, I have the variable x bar difference. 
Now, the parameter of interest is the average difference between reading and writing scores of all high school students. That's a difference that does exist in the population and that I want to estimate. And I want to know if that's different from zero or if people do well in reading and writing at the same level. I mean, there's no difference in the scores at all. So the point estimate would be the x diff that we just computed, right? So you compute for each pair and then you estimate that population parameter, the difference in the population by computing the difference, the average difference in your sample. So that's our point estimate. If in fact there was no difference between the scores on the reading and writing exams, what would you expect the difference to be? Imagine there is no difference. Reading and writing performance is just the same. If you know one, you basically know the other. The difference should be zero, right? So the null hypothesis would say that the mean difference of reading and writing scores in the population is exactly zero. So back to our problem. How are the distributions? What is the distribution telling us? It's telling us that writing is the median writing score is a bit higher than the median reading score. Um, and then one question we can ask is whether this difference, um, this higher performance in writing is reliable statistically. So two questions we're gonna address, what's the average difference in math and reading scores? And the second question is, do students score higher in writing than in reading? So it's what's the average difference in writing and in write and reading scores? So we have the average difference here. Again, we can compute an average difference. And we said that if it's less than zero, it's because the writing is larger than the reading because we're doing read minus write, right? This is the standard deviation of the difference. And this is the number of scores that I have. So again, every time I have a point estimate, so the difference here is saying that's negative 0.5, which is telling us that there is a 0.5 difference benefiting the writing, writing is better. Um, but we can compute a margin of, margin of error around it so that we have a nice net to be more likely to grab the true um, mean difference in the population. So as usual, we'll have the x difference, the point estimate, plus or minus a margin of error that's multiplied by the, the margin of error that is the, the standard error um, of the mean difference times the t-critical. The t-critical that puts the boundary in the distribution that leaves the, the that keeps, you know, the confidence level that we want. Two steps. If we're asking a question that is directional, we can get the t-critical for 90%, for example, um, 0.95, and say what the degrees of freedom are, which is 200 minus 1, and get the interval, right? So here it is. Because remember, we're asking whether writing is better, our hypothesis that writing is higher score than reading. Uh, so the confidence interval that goes with a directional type of hypothesis is the 90% um, because the boundary leaves 5% rejection area in each side, which is what we want for directional tests. So here is the average difference plus or minus the critical value that gives us the 90% confidence times the standard deviation of the difference divided by square root of n. So the average difference between writing and reading is negative 1.58 somewhere with 90% confidence somewhere between negative 158 to 0 0.49. Sorry, one second. So to sum up, what is the average difference in writing and reading scores? We're 90% confident that the difference between writing and reading is between negative 1.58 to 0 0.49 points. Now, do students score higher in writing than in reading? The null hypothesis is that the mean difference in the population is zero. Difference between reading and writing. That's how it's computed. And that the alternative hypothesis is that writing gets better scores. So 
translating mean difference less than zero because if writing is bigger that difference will be negative let's use the confidence interval to provide a quick and dirty assessment of the hypothesis and answer the question one sided test we want a five percent rejection area all to one side and if we're doing less than the lower tail is what interests us so we put the full five percent here uh, on one side. So the boundary here to define our rejection area will be equal to the boundary of a 90% interval. That's why a unidirectional or one-sided test goes with the 90% confidence interval. And we know that, that that confidence interval is somewhere between negative 1.58 to 0.49. So zero does not fall in the rejection area, does it? It does not, it's in the middle of the two. So quick and dirty, the null hypothesis will not be rejected, right? But this thing does not give us a p-value. So we need to actually, to get the p-value, the probability of getting that difference, the average difference that we did get under the hypothesis that there is no difference, if we're sampling from a distribution with no difference, to get that probability, we need to run a one-sided test. So here are the parameters that we need, the average difference, the standard deviation of the average difference, and the sample size. And here's our T uh, computation. It's the average difference minus the null, the expected difference under the null, divided by the standard error, which is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So we get a t of negative 87. And if we get a t distribution with 200 degrees of freedom, and we put uh, our value of 0.87, it is out of the rejection area of that distribution. And the probability of getting this value and more extreme to the negative side only is 0.19. That's more than, um, that's more than the 0 0.05. So the likelihood of observing this difference here or more extreme is 0.19, okay? So when I'm running a directional test, remember less than zero, I'm looking at the lower tail probability, the value n lower. If I'm running difference greater than, I would be looking at this side here and it would be a huger probability even right all right so now we're gonna go and do some hands-on activity in the lab in order to solidify your ability to actually use and understand the reasons for using t-tests to solve problems and answer interesting questions all right so i'll see you in the lab bye, -bye.